CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Diamonds, they say, are forever and are therefore the most lasting of all declarations of love. However, being human, it is unfortunately true that our sentiments, particularly our amorous ones, are frequently subject to change without notice. Therefore, what does a poor diamond do when its natural brilliance is no longer equaled by the flame of the love that inspired its purchase? It all depends on the diamond. Henri respects your opinion, Monsieur de Maupassant. Because of you, he broke his engagement to me. Oh, it's not for me to decide these things. I came up here to get your blessing, and I won't leave without it. Well, what makes you think that I would be willing? Monsieur de Maupassant, I don't think you will have the heart to refuse me. mystery drama, Leave Well Enough Alone, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars John Beale. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The great French writer Guy de Maupassant was intrigued by jewelry. He felt that love for precious stones ranked among the highest of all human vanities. And to him, human vanity was the very staff of his creative life. Indeed, de Maupassant's The Necklace is probably the greatest short story ever written. Not quite so well known is another de Maupassant tale that deals with valuable gems. And just as intriguing as the story itself is de Maupassant's account of how he came to write it. That year, I was living at 81 Rue des Capucines. My second floor apartment faced the rear. And Monsieur Henri Lantin occupied the rooms to the front. He was a snug little man who held a snug little clerkship in some snug little government bureau. And he enjoyed a snug little income. He was always most polite and pleasant every time we would meet. Ah, good morning, Monsieur de Maupassant. Good morning, Monsieur Lantin. And how goes the art of writing today? Mm, slowly. <laughs> May I ask a question? By all means. You writing fellows, where do you get your ideas? From life. Life? Oh, the life that flows ceaselessly all about us. Oh, <laughs> I look at the life that flows all about me, and I don't get any ideas at all. Ah, oh, well, perhaps it's because I'm not a writer. But also because I'm surrounded by rather quite ordinary people. All of us are surrounded by rather quite ordinary people. Indeed, rather ordinary people may provide the greatest inspiration of all. Is that a fact? Mm. You mean that a quite ordinary person, such as myself could provide you with an inspiration for a story? Oh, that's possible. And so it would go. He would read my stories when they appeared and compliment me profusely, especially when he didn't understand them. But then, one day, I noticed that he had begun to be somewhat nervous in my presence. He no longer went out of his way to stop for a chat. I wondered if perhaps I had offended him in some way. When... He suddenly insisted on treating me to a glass of wine at the establishment on the street. Monsieur de Maupassant, uh, may I ask you a question? Certainly, Monsieur Lantin. What do you think of me? Uh, do I impress you as a, a somewhat ridiculous person? Oh, no. Uh, how would you characterize me? That is, assuming you were to put me in a story. Well, I would say that you are a most... Industrious sort of man. Intelligent? Friendly? Sophisticated? Pleasant? I'm sure you wonder why I'm asking these questions. Yes. 
Uh, I, I'm contemplating a rather radical step. Radical, Monsieur Lontar? Or radical, that is, for me. Oh. I've... I've decided to get married. Well, congratulations. I've decided that a man does not live by bread alone. Very well put. Well, that's in the Bible. Uh, I know. Deuteronomy 8.3. Uh -huh. Also Matthew 4.4. 4. But I'd been doing it. Doing what? Living by bread alone. Oh. Or I should say for bread alone. Monsieur de Maupassant, I have spent my life working for bread. Haven't we all? But I haven't done anything else. All day I'm at the office. Do you know what I do there? I keep a record of all the ropes, chains, and anchors that are required for the naval base at Toulon. Oh, that seems to be a very responsible, important, and certainly a necessary activity. Monsieur de Maupassant, surely as a writer you should appreciate the poetic justice of what I've just said. In what manner? I deal with ropes, chains, and anchors. And these are all commodities whose function is to... to confine, to hold back, restrict. Ah. It seems that all my life I've been restricted to my desk at the office and my easy chair at home. To be alone is to be half alive. Just think of what it means to have a pretty wife who waits for you at home, who greets you with warm kisses and hot soup. It sounds delicious. Ah, to share one's life. I wish you the best of fortune in this enterprise, Monsieur Lontar. No doubt you've already decided on the fortunate young lady. No, as yet I don't know who she is. But I've made up my mind to look. I see. I shall now devote my energies to the problem... And I know I shall succeed in my quest. After all, seek and you shall find. That's very crisply stated, Monsieur Lontar. Of course, it's from the Bible. The little man was so sincere, so earnest. His round, honest face shone with such goodwill, one was forced to take him seriously. And every time we would encounter each other in the hallway or on the street... He would always advise me of his progress. Or, more accurately, his lack of progress. No, Monsieur de Maupassant, she eludes me still. One would imagine there's no shortage of eligible ladies. Eligible, yes. Special, no. And in what way must she be special? In a way that shall make itself apparent the moment I lay eyes upon her. I look for her everywhere. All the time. But so far... Don't lose courage, Monsieur Lontar. One day out of a clear blue sky, when you least expect it, there she will be. And so it would go. Weeks, months went by, and still Monsieur Lontar remained a bachelor. Now, you mustn't think that I had nothing to do but worry about his marital problems, or rather the lack of them, but I was impressed by his very deep feelings. One day, I encountered Monsieur Lantin in the little park near our lodgings. Monsieur de Maupassant, I'm very much afraid of you. What's this? Afraid of me? Why? You see, I, I, I did find her. Oh, well, this calls for a celebration. I, I, I don't know how to begin this. The best place to begin any story is at the beginning. Go forward. How old do you think I am? Oh. Uh, be honest. Oh, 40? No, I, I shall hold nothing back. I'm 45. But a most youthful and vigorous-looking 45. Do you really think so? Of course. Well, that really doesn't have much to do with it. Celeste. Ah, uh, Celeste. Celeste. A lovely name. Celeste is 18. Oh, Yes, I knew you would say, oh. oh. I meant nothing by it. It was merely, oh, well, these uh, disparities in age are not uncommon. Why did you say disparities? Because the word describes a, a, a difference. Well, then why didn't you say difference? Disparity implies inequality or even incongruity. 
As a writer, surely you must be aware of that. Oh, please forgive me. But you've made your point. What point is this? It's the point you make in everything you write. You always express a cynical attitude toward most human behavior. I admit to being a cynic, Monsieur Lontin. But that's only because I'm a frustrated romantic. All your stories have a kind of sardonic ending. I'll say rather that they try for a human ending. You're laughing at me. No, no. Oh, what a fool I must be. She's young enough to be my daughter. Come now, Monsieur Lantin, you accuse me unfairly. You say to yourself, why the old goat? What dangerous delusion does he permit himself? You're saying to yourself, why, if he must marry at all, why, why doesn't he choose some plump widow or, or, or ripe spinster nearer his own age? Well? Well, since you have put the question into my mouth, you might as well place the answer there, too. It's because I'm not a stick, not a stone. I have life in me. I want youth. I want beauty. I want freshness and romance. I want everything I missed. Then by all means, take it. Yes. I could settle for an older woman. That would be the safe way to do it. But I'm willing to take the chance. The chance? That she'll tire of me and then laugh at me. And finally, betray me. That's what happens in all marriages like this one. Not all marriages. In all the ones you write about. Monsieur Lantern, I cannot accept the responsibility for influencing the most important decision of your life. Just talking to you has made it clear to me. I cannot marry Celeste. I am only a writer of fiction. Actually, I am... I'm not better qualified to advise No, you. no. To marry Celeste, I see it now, would be to go against my true nature. Are you sure you know what your true nature is? No, it... It will be better for both of us. I shall break the engagement. Suddenly, here I was, the villain of the piece. But perhaps it was for the best. And so, I thought, this was the end of the matter. But one afternoon, there was a knock at my door. Standing at the threshold was a tall, dark, slender young lady. She had long, lustrous black hair. And a face of such radiant beauty that, at first glimpse, I almost blinked my eyes. She smiled at me. A dazzling smile. You are Monsieur de Bonpasson. Yes? May I come in? I am Celeste Laurier. Celeste Laurier? Oh, Celeste? Yes. Of course you may come in, mademoiselle. Thank you. However, aren't you afraid that you might be compromised? Oh, no, monsieur. You are, after all, a gentleman. I don't consider myself a gentleman. Well, you have nothing to say about it. You're tuned to WBBM in Chicago. Gentlemen are born. They cannot change their essential natures. I'm sure you haven't come here to talk about me. Ah, but I have. Why? Because I wish to marry Monsieur Henri Lantin. And what have I to do with it? Everything. I'm afraid you're making a mistake. No. Henri worships you. Oh, no. But to him you are the font of all wisdom. He broke our engagement because you disapproved. I assure you, mademoiselle, I did not disparage the idea. Neither did you endorse it. However, let us consider. Because of you, he ended the engagement. And because of you, he can renew it. Because of me? How? All you need do is give the idea your blessing. But, mademoiselle, it is not for me. I came up here with every intention of receiving your blessing. I shall not depart empty-handed. Well, what makes you believe that I... Monsieur de Maupassant, I don't think you will have the heart to refuse me. Tell you this... 
If she turned that dazzling smile at me, I'm not sure I would have the heart to refuse her either. She sounds like a young lady who usually gets what she wants. But this time, of course, her adversary is the great Guy de Maupassant. But what does that have to do with anything? Aren't writers just as easily seduced as anyone else? I'll be back soon with Act Two. December, as you do in May. This sentiment is part of a popular song written by, of all people, a former mayor of New York City. But what if we have May and December to begin with? May and December. On the face of it, this does not sound like a promising couple. However, marriages are said to be made in heaven. You have come for my blessing? Yes. And why should I give this affair my blessing? Why not? Very well, I know. He told me. The disparity in our ages. Disparity. A rather cutting word. Yours? No, his. I will be a good wife to him. Do you love him? Is that important? Well, it should be the foundation of all marriages. Some marriages, perhaps. But not all. Besides... He has no right to expect love from a girl of 18. Why not? Well, isn't that rather presumptuous for a man of 50? 50? Well, that surprises you. No, Mademoiselle, nothing surprises me anymore. Well, the best he can hope for is respect, loyalty, admiration, and warmth. These I am prepared to give him. And who is to say that the sum total of all these do not add up to love. Why, mademoiselle, are you prepared to do so? Because he shall save me. I don't understand. From what? A young woman of your most spectacular attributes. I should think thousands of men would be at your feet. In a word, why settle for Henri Lantern? Oh, if I were a character in one of your stories, how well you would understand me. My father was a country physician. He had a heart for all the world. He took his fees and potatoes and pumpkins. He died penniless. I have no dowry. But these days, that's no longer the impediment it used to be. Well, my poor mother has not been swamped with offers for my hand. Setting love aside... The sensible people marry for practical reasons. But once again, why Henri Lantin? The truth, monsieur? He is the only one who has ever asked me. I find that impossible to believe. Oh, I have received offers from men of wealth and position, but not offers of marriage. You understand. And so, monsieur, I consider Henri. He is honest, Decent, sincere. He is moderately secure. He will adore me. You are a most remarkable young woman. <laughs> a woman requires a man's protection. I will make him happy. And why not? He shall have what he wants. And you, mademoiselle, shall you have what you want? I shall have what I need. And shall you be faithful to him? No one, monsieur, shall ever catch me being false to my marriage vow. What can I say? It seems this marriage was made in heaven. I gave the marriage my blessing. It was easy. He put up a show of resistance, but at heart he was only too willing to be convinced. What can she see in me? I, I'm 46 years of age. But have you ever looked in the mirror recently? Have you ever seen a more manly face, a face of such wisdom, virtue, honesty? Oh, please, Monsieur de Maupassant. I mean it. I have seen this girl. You have? Where? How? Oh, I've made discreet inquiries. I have contacts. And? Oh, she is an angel. She's the perfect type of virtuous woman whom every sensible man dreams of winning. And you have won her. Claim your prize. They 
were married shortly after. He was unspeakably happy. True, he was only a government clerk, but she governed the household so cleverly, so economically, that they seemed to live in luxury. She lavished the most delicate attention on him. She was so sweet, so loving, that I began to fear for my own sanity. And thus, a few years passed. One evening, I knocked on their door. Ah, Monsieur de Maupassant, come in, please, come in. Thank you. I came by to see if, um, if perhaps I could trouble you for some sugar. Oh, but of course. My cleaning woman generally forgets to see to these things. Huh. That is why a man should have a wife. Perhaps. Oh, how beautifully the place is furnished. <laughs> uh, a woman's touch, my friend. And even more than touch, her inborn understanding of how to run a household. What a manager. And how is Madame Lauter? Oh, she'll be so sorry she missed you. She's at the opera. Oh? She has this weakness for the opera. She goes constantly. Oh. And you don't go with her? Oh, I did at first, but I get so dreadfully bored. <laughs> I fall fast to sleep. So... So she, she, she goes alone, huh? Oh, no, no, no. She has many girlfriends. Ah. One cannot begrudge her this little amusement. Oh, I suppose not. Of course, I can understand her love for the opera. But I cannot understand the other thing. What other thing? The jewels. Jewels? Oh, <laughs> they're not really jewels, actually. They're, they're, they're just imitations, you know. Rhinestones and, and fake pearls and paste diamonds. Imitation gold and the like. She loves to adorn herself in those things. Uh, what harm is there in that? None, I suppose. Then why do you object? I don't know. Y yes, I do. It all creates a false note. Sh she's such a genuine, sincere person... I can't understand why she should be fascinated by these cheap imitations. Perhaps you forget something. Yes? Well, you look at her. She's so womanly, so wise. She runs your home so efficiently. She makes you so comfortable, so happy, that you don't really stop to think that she's only a girl. After all, she's hardly 20. Yes, that's true, I suppose. Poor child. Perhaps I'm too hard on her. Well, my advice to you, as a friend, Monsieur Lantin, is to let well enough alone. Ah, oh, Henri, my darling, and Monsieur de Maupassant. <coughs> Good evening, Madame Lantin. I thought you'd gone to the opera. <coughs> I left early. <coughs> I think I'm catching a cold. Oh, we must get you to bed at once. I haven't caught it yet. Oh, Henri, darling... We must offer Monsieur de Maupassant some refreshment. Uh, yes, yes, of course. You are angry. Well, I'm not angry. It's no use. I can tell when my darling Henri is displeased. My dear, I am not in the least bit. Ah, then, you refuse to tell me. Well, look at you, all that cheap jewelry. Oh, but I love jewelry. And I'm so fond of these little baubles. It's my only weakness. But, my dear Celeste, oh, I... Please, don't be cross with me. She gave him a look of such tenderness, and he returned it with a look of such love and longing that I sensed immediately this was a scene that called for two people, not three. I mumbled an excuse and took my leave. A few evenings later, there was a knock on my own door. Monsieur de Maupassant, are you engaged this evening? No, come in. I wonder, my good sir, could you accompany me to the opera? The opera? I thought you found it a place for sleep. I'll confess. I need the services of a friend. Who else can I ask but you? Sit down. Oh, what's the trouble? Read this note. Monsieur Henri Lantin. I'm sure your wife tells you she goes to the opera with a lady friend. But this evening, you will see her there with her lover, a handsome cavalry officer. And you believe this note? What can I say? You can say that you have every confidence in your wife's loyalty 
and faithful. I do, I do, but... Yes? I'm so frightened. Of what? A scurrilous message from some evil-minded person who hasn't the courage to sign his or her name. What would you advise me to do? Tear it up and forget it. I love her so much, and I'm so afraid. Monsieur Longtemps, I advise you to leave well enough alone. Someone is jealous of your happiness. I must know. But don't you know now? Don't you know in your own heart that she's innocent? Are you unable to answer that? I believe in Celeste as I would believe in my own soul, but... We have a but. This insistence she has for wearing false jewels, how can you explain it? That's a schoolgirl's vanity. But she isn't a schoolgirl. I... I must know. I must go to the opera tonight. I have said this before, and I'll say it again. Leave well enough alone. Will you come with me? I'd rather not. Please, Monsieur de Maupassant, be at my side. Because if that note is the truth, then someone must restrain me from committing an act I shall regret for the rest of my life. Is it possible that the party might become just a little bit rough? You never know with these French love stories. Well, she's either cheating on him or she isn't. Or can there be a third possibility? One thing you can be sure of, there is a third act. Is it possible to have complete confidence, absolute trust in another human being? As it says in the book, we walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, to believe with all one's heart and soul, to hold nothing in reserve. Is all this beyond the powers of poor Monsieur Henri Latin? Yet, if he would be happy with his beautiful young wife, it is what he is being asked to do. Once again, I ask you, Monsieur Lontin, let us go home. I can't. You'll see. She'll come out of the opera. She'll walk down those steps alone or with a lady friend. And then how shall you feel? How shall I feel? Yes. You already know what emotions will be generated inside you if she's with a man. But have you thought of how it will be if that note is a hoax? I'll feel such a blessed relief. And you may also feel something that is neither blessed nor relief. You shall feel guilt and remorse because you have allowed yourself to question her integrity. Oh, please. Let me hail that cab and I shall take you home. Put these terrible suspicions out of your mind forever. Yes, I, I, I know what you're going to say. Leave well enough alone. But I cannot. You don't know what it is to be my age, a man of 47, no longer young, married to a beautiful goddess. I envy you. Pity me. I am tormented by the thought that I'm not good enough for her. Nonsense. I see how the men turn to look at her when we're out together. I see the envy on their faces. I read the desire in their eyes. These men are rich, handsome, vigorous. But she chose you. Has she lived to regret it? Has she? Does she seem to love you any the less? No. Does she neglect you? Is she less kind, less warm, less loving? No. Then why must you torture yourself? Please, let me satisfy myself just this one time. I can't help myself. We walked up the steps and into the great lobby. We stood behind a massive marble pillar where we could see without being seen. We could hear the wonderful Offenbach music welling up from the inside of the theater. Once again, I tried to convince him to leave, but he wouldn't listen. I don't know how long we stood there. Finally, it was finished. And the hall began to empty out. There was a kaleidoscope of brilliant uniforms, beautiful gowns. And then, we saw her. 
It's Celeste. Alone. Yes. Alone. No. She's with that lady. They, they're coming this way. They, they, they mustn't see us. Thank you for your company this evening, Madeline. But I must go right home. <coughs> I have this little cough. Quick, before she sees us. Is this what you propose to do now? Slink off with your tail between your legs? Shall we let this radiant lady go home by herself? I, I am so ashamed. You well deserve to be. I shall never, never, as long as I live, doubt her again. Madame Lantern. What are you doing? Madame Lantern. Why, it's Monsieur de Montfaucon and, and Henri. What are you doing here? Well, you see, uh, Henri here discovered that this is my birthday. He insisted on taking me out to a small supper. And I suggested that we stop by here... And have you join us? Oh, I shall be delighted. <coughs> that cough, my darling. Oh, it's nothing. Nothing. It mustn't spoil our evening. It was a modest little supper in a modest little restaurant. But in many ways, it was the most magnificent party of my life. She was so gay, so sparkling, so filled with animation and life. And she so obviously adored her little Henri. But all good things must come to their end. Oh, they've stopped playing. Yes, my dear. See, they're putting away their instruments. <coughs> what, what a pity. And now we must go home. Oh, I should love to walk. But it's raining, my dearest. <coughs> but I... But I love <coughs> to walk in the rain. Not with that cough. Now, you two wait here. I'll go and fetch us a cab. Happy birthday, Monsieur de Maupassant. Thank you, Madame Lantin. I wish I had known. I would have brought you a gift. But you've already given me one. I don't remember. And I won't forget, Madame Lantin. Celeste. Celeste. You have done something... That no one has been able to do to me before. Have I? You've made me change my mind. About what? You have given me a kind of faith in my fellow man that I have never known, nor allowed myself to know. I'm flattered. No, this is beyond flattery. You have kept your word. You have been faithful to your husband. You made that vow, remember? Oh, yes. I did say that to you. I remember. I said no one would ever catch me being false to my oath of marriage. But I never believed you. I never trusted you. I said to myself, how can this girl who's so filled with life be satisfied with a quiet, unexciting... Well, well, he is a stick in the mud, isn't he? <laughs> yes, monsieur. But you see, he's my stick in the mud. Madame, you make me ashamed of my cynicism. Then, my good Guy de Maupassant, go forward from this day and... <coughs> and sin no more. Celeste. <coughs> it's nothing. Nothing. <coughs> I just feel cold. I'm... I'm chilled, that's all. <coughs> it's nothing. <laughs> But it was everything. We took her home and summoned the doctor. The chills gave way to a sudden and what proved to be overwhelming onslaught of fever. Poor child. How quickly she became delirious. Henri. See, Henri. How pretty they are. See, Henri. How they glitter. How they gleam. See? Oh, oh, my poor darling. Fire. Fire and ice. Try to rest. I want to look pretty. I want to look rich. For my Henri. I'm a physician's daughter. I'm, I'm somebody. Oh. I want people to look at me and, and know I'm somebody. Buy me diamonds. Henri. Yes, yes. Promise. Promise. 
I promise. But it was a promise he could never keep. She died the next day. Poor girl. All that life, all that love. Henri was inconsolable. He could think of nothing. He could talk of no one except his poor Celeste. He refused to go anywhere or see anyone, not even me. He did manage somehow to drag himself to the office and go through the motions of his job. But though I had heard he was in a bad way, and even in debt, I tried to help him, but he rejected all my overtures. And then, one evening, he called on me. He had a wooden jewel box in his hand. I was shocked to see him. He was practically white-haired. He had hollow cheeks. His shoulders were stooped. He was an old, defeated man. I'm being punished. Celeste was taken away from me because I doubted her. My dear friend, you mustn't believe that. Life has become so hard for me. Celeste knew how to spend my money, how to make it last, uh, how to buy wisely. We had such excellent wines, such rare delicacies. How could she manage to buy such wonderful things? I can't even pay my own expenses. Uh, uh, time, you know, is a great healer. Today, for the first time since uh, I was able to go into our bedroom... And I saw this box. It's the one in which she kept all those false gems. And I can no longer stand the sight of them. They were the cause of the trouble between us. I, I want you to get rid of them for me. Oh? I, I would break them into bits or burn them or throw them into the rubbish. But I haven't the heart. Oh, please do me this favor. Well, of course, they're just paste and base metal, but still, some of them are very prettily made. They may be worth a few francs. Uh, I, I refuse to allow oh, it. Oh, come now, listen. You just said you were in debt. Every penny helps. And wouldn't it be a satisfaction to her if she could know that these trinkets of hers could provide you with a meal, perhaps? Or a new shirt? Come, let me arrange it for you, my good friend. Yes, monsieur. Um, I have here, um, well, uh, let me see. To begin with, uh, a necklace. Uh, what can you give me for this? May I examine it, please? I know well enough, monsieur, that it isn't really worth anything. Uh, this necklace, sir, is worth 15,000 francs. What? What, what are you saying? But we could not arrange for a purchase unless you can prove it belongs to you. Are you serious? Of course. I know this necklace. I sold it myself. You, you, you're crazy. Sir, have you come into my shop in order to question my sanity? No, no, no. Forgive me. It is, it's time I question my own. I sold this necklace to a young nobleman, the Chevalier de Aumont. He instructed me to have it delivered to uh, Madame Celeste Lantam at 81 Rue de Capuchine. Oh, well, say no more, monsieur. Say no more. On the contrary, I believe it's time to say a great deal. <laughs> she kept her promise. She didn't promise to be faithful. She said, no one will ever catch me being false to my marriage vows. <laughs> I salute you, Celeste. You have now restored my true faith in humanity. Sir, I must ask you how you come to be in possession of this necklace. I am acting for Monsieur Henri Lantin, husband of the late Celeste Lantin. The late Celeste? Oh, unfortunately. Oh, I didn't know. I wondered why business had been so slow of late. Um... Oh, the rest of this lot, are they also... Uh... I recognize them. 
And were they all purchased by the amorous Chevalier de Ormond? Oh, no, sir, no. The earrings, I remember, were the gift of a Captain Navarrete. And the brooch was a uh, <laughs> Duke de Renaudon. The pearls, a Major René de Bonneval. The bracelets, uh, let me think it was Monsieur Dufour. No, no, he bought the tiara. Ah, that Russian Count Orloff was the one who... Well, at any rate, I can look this all up for you. Uh, no, 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 it won't be necessary. Um, what will you give for all of it? Well, sir, you cannot expect me to give you what I was paid for. Uh, a fair price. Well, uh, <clears throat> save time, trouble, and say, um... 280,000 francs. 280,000? Yeah, very well. Round it off at 300,000. Shop around, sir. You'll find you'll do no better. I accept. Good. And now, sir, a little formality. Have you proof that you are acting for Monsieur Latin? Has he given you a written authorization? Oh, that might present us with a, a difficulty... You see, this, this is a most delicate matter. I, uh, I hope you understand. Mm, perfectly. It might be awkward if Monsieur Lantin knew that these were actually real gems. Do you um, perceive the problem? Uh, of course. Well, could you just give me the money? Well, could you assure me that this money will find its way into Monsieur Lantin's purse? Well, let me see how this might be done. Now, uh, what was his brother's name. Ah, Eugene. Eugene. Monsieur de Maupassant. Monsieur de Maupassant, let me in. Let me in. Just a minute. Just a minute. Monsieur de Maupassant. Come in. Come in. What is it? I've never seen you so excited. Look. This letter. It just came in the post. Read it. It's from a firm of notaries. Read it. This is to inform you that your brother, Eugene Lantin, <laughs> who died last month in Indochina, named you as his sole heir. Your late brother's estate amounts to some 300,000 francs. Please inform... <laughs> 300,000 francs. Imagine. I'm rich. Rich. Yes. So you are. Oh, Monsieur de Maupassant, life is so filled with irony. Celeste. Oh, my poor Celeste. She would have been so happy. Uh, I can only say that you must make it your business to be happy enough for two. Yes. Oh, my darling Celeste. Just think. If only you had lived... I would have been able to buy you real gems. And thus, Monsieur Guy de Maupassant ends his story. And for those who always thought that he did not use happy endings as a rule, remember, most of his stories have reasonably happy endings. And isn't this one about as happy an ending as we have a right to expect? I'll be back shortly. The philosophy expounded in our little tale is stated in the title, Leave Well Enough Alone. It is perhaps the most consistently disregarded maxim in our language. There are those who cannot live with success who are made uncomfortable by the smooth progress of everyday affairs. They must always roil still waters, tap on the glass of the reptile cage in the zoo, insist on fixing things that aren't broken. But we shouldn't complain. Without such folk, whatever would we do for stories? Our cast included John Beale, Court Benson, and Tracy Ellis. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for...
for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.